Hey, welcome everybody. Hope you enjoyed the uh, keynote this morning with David. Uh, we've got Paul S. Doran here with us. Uh, Paul's been in information security, cybersecurity. Do you like the term cybersecurity? No. Nope, okay. Paul's been in information security for over 15 years. You may already know Paul because of Security Weekly, and that's going on its 12th year now, publications. Um, and Paul will always be in information security, whether he wants to or not, because he's got three young boys. And as they grow up, you can be sure they're going to test his capabilities. There's a story about that. There's a next. story about that, okay. <laughs> so, and uh, Bernadette is, uh, is your room monitor, so if you have any issues, uh, let her know. And um, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Tom. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so Patrick asked me at the last moment to give a talk. And I'm like, well, I happen to put this one together. I'm like, it's that Kung Fu one. He's like, yeah, that'll work. So here I am. And welcome. Um, how many people here have children? Show of hands. Like that you know of? Like, I always get people like, I, I don't know how to, to answer that. Uh, so as Tom said, I, I have three boys. And my oldest son, Brayden, uh, is the best hacker and social engineer in the world. Uh, I know you, if you have children, you might think that your child is, and we can debate that after the talk. Um, but here's why. So the date of when all these events occurred is April 2nd, and that's very critical to the story. This is April 2nd. I have all three boys by myself, and I'm watching the boys. And you make this promise to yourself when you're watching three small children that you're not going to yell or raise your voice and yell ridiculous things, but inevitably, it happens that you're yelling ridiculous things like, don't put that light bulb in your mouth, or you have to wear pants at the table. I, 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 and it's just ridiculous. So I had one of those moments when I opened up the cabinet, and I found a gallon of milk in the cabinet. And of course, I yelled one of those ridiculous things. Why is there milk in the cabinet? And my son Braden's like, I don't know. He's like, Mom, you know how crazy Mommy is. Like, you know, it could have just ended up there. She thought it was the refrigerator. She's like, she's nuts. And so I'm like, all right. So I call my wife. I'm like, did you put the milk in the cabinet? She's like, what are you? She's like, are you all right? Do I need to come home? Because I'm really worried about you right now. I'm like, no, there's a gallon of milk in the cabinet. And she's like, you're crazy. You put the milk. I'm like, no, I didn't put the milk in the cabinet. No one wanted to own up to it. I'm like, all right. Well, I kind of brushed it off as an anomaly. So then I get all my children ready uh, to go out. And about two or three hours later, uh, those of you that have kids know exactly what I'm talking about. We get ready to get into the car. And when I open the door, so the other, uh, I have a, no, almost nine is Brayden, a uh, four-year-old uh, and a 10-month-old. I'm holding the little one, and I open the door, and there is poop on the child seat. And I'm like, in my house, it's not uncommon to see poop. Like, it happens in our house. Quite a bit, actually. If it looks like poop and it probably smells like, I mean, it's poop, right? So when I open the door, I'm like, that's definitely poop. I'm like, who left poop in the car? Again, I'm yelling ridiculous things. Who left poop on the child seat in the car? And Brandon's like, I don't know how that got there. I don't know what you're talking about. And then I look at it, and I'm like, it's definitely fake poop. I'm like, get in the car, and I call my wife. I'm like, did you leave poop in the car? She's like, all right, now I'm really, I'm coming home now. You're not allowed to watch the children anymore. I'm like, no, there was like poop in the, and then like it dawns on me and I have to, and Braden is not, he is not owning up to anything. I mean, he is straight faced, not even laughing when I'm talking. He is straight faced the whole time. And finally, I have to sit all the children down and I'd say, all right, who's behind all of this? And no one's owning up to it. I'm like, I'm turning the Wi-Fi off until some, for everyone, until someone confesses. And my four-year-old is hitting Braden with his iPad going, will you just confess? I want Wi-Fi. And finally, Braden confesses. And I'm like, dude, how did you do that? Like, first, how did you keep a straight face? Secondly, how did you get the milk in the cabinet with no one looking? Now I haven't got an answer to that one. I'm like, you got to tell me, how did you make the fake poop? Because, I mean, you can see the picture. Of, like, you would think that's poop, right? No, it's raspberry applesauce that he found in the back seat of the car with a piece of cardboard and fabricated. We also have four dogs. I know we're insane. And we have a puppy. And fabric. I'm like, dude, I'm so proud of you right now. <laughs> like, that is so awesome. So when people ask me, like, why do you give this talk and try and draw inspiration for hacking from hacker movies? I got to keep up with my son, Braden. So um, Tom kind of went over all of this. Um, I actually did study Kung Fu for about 10 years. I'm starting to get my kids back into it. 
and I've watched like a lot of kung fu movies. Um, I don't know if you ever use Giphy in the Slack channel where it puts up like images, and sometimes it's like a, a movie, like scene from a kung fu movie. I'm like, I have that movie. And they're like, nah, -uh, in my employees in my studio. I'm like, go in the corner and in the DVD rack, and it's there. They're like, wow, that's kind of impressive, actually. So I've watched a lot of kung fu movies. So I was sitting there. Uh, so this is my standard disclaimer that I put on all my, my slides. So if I like swear or, or put up an image or something, and you're easily offended, uh, that could happen. Not so much with this talk. At the 2 o'clock talk, though, you want to watch out for that. So uh, I was sitting there watching kung fu movies, and I'm like, there's a lot of stuff in here that really like relates. And I started making a list, and the list started growing. And I was like, wow, I, I think I have enough for a talk. So I broke it down into categories. Uh, the student and the teacher dynamic, uh, security and kung fu tactics, political and social, some other interesting, ridiculous things. Uh, and then, of course, I'm like, well, I have to share like my top 10 list of kung fu movies that you have to watch before you die. So, all right. The first is the student and teacher dynamic. And what I like about this segment is it talks about how to get into the security industry. And one of the things that you would do is find a mentor. I don't know if Keith Hoodlett is here in this room. Is he here in this room? OK. Find him. He, he runs a, a project along those lines, which I'll talk about. And I was like, wow, there's really like a good parallel between a kung fu teacher and your mentor in security. OK. So now here's the audience participation segment of the presentation. When I present these slides with the numbers on them, and it's a fact about a kung fu movie, everyone in the audience needs to say, in the kung fu movies, Wah! all right, can you, can you guys get ready? One, two, three. In the kung fu movies, Wah! OK. Your master will be a hermit living in the woods and reluctant to train you. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, they, they are reclusive from society, mostly because they don't want to... A lot of the storylines go, they taught a student, and that student ended up doing bad things with their training, and therefore they want to go live in the woods so no one finds them. Um, and they hide their skills, right? They don't want everyone to know that they're a kung fu master, because then people will show up outside their doorstep and be like, hey, can you teach me kung fu? So they also hide their skills. Um, in the computer and hacking world, um, it's the same level of responsibility, right? If I teach people how to hack into things and break into things, that's a responsibility that I have, that I teach the right people. Then it's a responsibility of the person that I've taught to make sure that they don't do evil things. So it's a very similar parallel. Um, also, uh, learning uh, computer security, whether offense or defense or both, it's really hard. You have to have a lot of background in a lot of different technologies to understand how to break into systems, understand complex systems. And if I'm going to spend the time with someone, I want to make sure they stick with it. And that's another reason why Kung Fu teachers will be very reluctant to train people, is that they want to make sure that they're going to stick with it, that they're going to be able to endure all of that hard work. Um, now, fortunately for us, we don't have to go out in the woods and seek out a Kung Fu master, although that'd be really cool though, right? Like, hey, today we're going out in the woods and we're going to find someone to teach us hacking. Um, you can, now you can just go to a website. Uh, it's infosecmentors.net. Uh, Keith Hoodlett and Jimmy Vo run that site today. This stems from a project that came out of a B-Sides conference a long time ago. Um, Jimmy and Keith have taken over the project. They've built an entirely new website. You can go there, and it's kind of like a dating site for information security professionals is the best way to put it. I don't think Keith Red likes it when I reference it like that, but I'm like, dude, you kind of built like a dating site. Because I can go register on there and I say I want to mentor someone, and someone can say, hey, I want to be mentored, and then we list our individual skills, skills you want to learn, skills I want to teach, and then they match us together. And then we can like hold hands and go for walks on the beach and I can tell you about Metasploit. Um, so, SANS also has a mentorship program as well. Uh, it's not as romantic as infosecmentors.net, um, but it does allow you to take a class with SANS, learn some stuff, and then help other people uh, with that as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so again, with the communications, you know, again, you don't have to go out in the woods and, and find a, a computer teacher, uh, I mean, a, a kung fu teacher. You can just go online, and there's lots of ways you can communicate with your mentor today, right? We don't have to go live in the woods for 10 years and learn Kung Fu. We can communicate with our mentor in any number of different ways, right? We can do IRC if you're old like me, or Slack if you're not so old. 
um, and uh, do that social in, uh, interaction with everyone and mentor people in our field. And I encourage you, if you're not, uh, like if you're just getting into the field, but you know some stuff, like he's like, I, I know some security stuff, but my background is really web programming. Like, dude, that's awesome. Like, I want to learn web programming, and I'll teach you some security stuff. And he's like, yeah, I'll teach you some you know, web programming stuff. So you don't have to be an expert Kung Fu master to go on there uh, and take advantage of the site. Okay, so now in the... All right, all together now, one, two, three. Your master will be drunk and punish you for taking shortcuts. Now, now the drunk part we'll get to, but more importantly, you will be punished for taking shortcuts. Now, in the Kung Fu movies, there are all kinds of, like, it looks like a bondage film. I know when you put that stuff up there, it's really not. It's actually mimicking Kung Fu training. And you think it's ridiculous, right? Until I watched that movie right there that I can't remember the name off the top of my head. I apologize. But he's made to do push-ups. He's learning mantis-style Kung Fu, right? You have to have really strong fingers. So he's doing push-ups on his fingers. And he would get tired and his palms would fall. And so the teacher put eggs underneath his hands, and then his palms would fall and squish the eggs, and he couldn't eat them. So he had to get stronger if he wanted to eat the eggs. If he tried to take the master's eggs or steak or whatever, the master would like fight him off with his chopsticks. It's awesome. Um, so I mean, that was incentive. Like food is a good incentive. Fortunately for us in computer security, we can still eat and learn hacking. That's cool, uh, but not in the kung fu movies. So. Uh, and after I watched that film, I went to my own Kung Fu class, and I always wanted to learn Mantis style. And then my teacher's like, well, you have to start doing push-ups on your fingers. And I'm like, you're not going to put eggs under my hands, are you? He's like, what? He's like, stop watching those ridiculous movies, will you? <laughs> so shortcuts lead to a lot of really bad things. On the defensive side, shortcuts lead to exposures in our network. Uh, and that can manifest itself in a number of different ways. Um, one, and one of the ways I think in the teacher-student dynamic that I like to use, because everyone should use VI, and if you use Emacs, don't talk to me. But if, so if you're using a real editor like VI, um, my great story is when I was learning Linux uh, in like 1998 or so, 97, it was like Red Hat 5.0-ish time frame is when I first started learning Linux. And my friend that worked as a programmer with me for the company I was working for in college he had learned Linux in, in school. I'm like, that's great. Like, they don't have Linux in, I went to Bryant University at the time. There wasn't much Linux there. I mean, this was a long time ago, because I'm old. And so he started teaching me Linux. And I'm like, dude, I really want to learn. Like, I see you in this editor, dude. And like, you're doing amazing things. Like, your hands are moving, and like, text is moving all over the place in edits. I'm like, dude, I got to learn that. I'm like, that's awesome. So he sits me down in front of VI, and I go back to my little like, arrow keys, and he literally <laughs> hits my hand. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, never use the arrow keys in VI. He's like, always use the keys so that your hands never have to leave. So after much training and practice, I never used the arrow keys again. And I was much better in the editor. I could type faster. I could edit faster. Um, so that's kind of like a crossover between like learning from a kung fu teacher and learning uh, you know, computers and security. Um, the other thing, you know, where shortcuts will get you is in a pen test or vulnerability assessment. Now, granted, we have a limited amount of time. However, don't take shortcuts when you're assessing the security of someone's network. Obviously, you're going to miss something that could lead to bad things happening later. Um, so one of the, the interesting things that people tend to take in shortcuts that I've noticed, uh, I'm an INS faculty member. Um, I also talk with a lot of people in the community. Uh, who are in various levels in their organization of security. And when we start talking about a solution, a lot of times it comes down to these things that are up on the screen behind me. And that is, they're like, well, I want to do incident response is a good one. I want to do some kind of endpoint protection. I want to do whatever you want to do in security. And I start asking them these questions. I'm like, so what constitutes sensitive data in your environment? And what are the different criticality, criticality levels of that data in your environment? And who has access to all of that data? And where does that data travel? And like at this point, they're like, oh my god, that's so much work. I don't know what you're talking about. And then we just want to take a short. They're like, can I just put like a firewall and antivirus? And I'm like, no. Like, you really have to know that stuff in order to effectively put measures in place for security in your organization. If you don't, you're taking a shortcut. And 
what I've learned about this process is one, it's hard. Uh, two, there are actually some vendor solutions. If you talk to me after, we can, we can talk about some of those. Um, we actually just took a sponsor on, on Security Weekly because they, when I started talking with them, I'm like, wait, you help with this problem. They're like, yeah, yeah, we do. I'm like, good, I, now I want you as a sponsor. And then my other friend went to work there, which further validated it. But if you want to talk about that, come flag me down after. So there are things that can help you with this process because it's hard, but don't skip it because it's a shortcut. Now, back to drinking. This is one of my good friends passed out in a chair at DEF CON. Can anyone identify the seemingly infamous person that is in this photo? Anyone? You? No, aside, no, I'm not there. I wasn't there for this one. I was passed out on the other lounge chair on the other side of the pool. <clears throat> anyone recognize this person right here a as Jeff Moss, the person that created DEF CON and Black Hat? This was my friend's chance to meet Jeff Moss, who's a super, super nice guy. He's awesome. And this was his chance, and he, he drank too much. So when you mentor people in this field, make sure you tell them that, yes, when you go to conferences, there will be drinking. I use this slide also when I uh, present about security to high school and college students as well. When you're getting into it, you got to be responsible and like don't miss your chance to meet Jeff Moss and have, I don't know if you can see it, there is stuff written on his forehead as well. <laughs> so, just saying. Okay, now, in the... <laughs> you can learn Kung Fu by getting your ass kicked. This is so awesome. So we already talked about how teachers don't want to teach you Kung Fu, right? So one of the tactics that they would use in the movies is they would just challenge them to a fight. And if they resisted, like they would just throw things at them and just basically force them into a fight. And as they were getting their ass handed to them, they would take, take mental notes, like, oh, he's using this technique or that technique, and they would try and learn kung fu while they were fighting. Now, you see this picture? That's a chicken, okay? In this movie, Shaolin vs. Llama, which is one of the greatest kung fu flicks ever, uh, he is bribing the teacher with a chicken to get him to teach him kung fu. Uh, hopefully we don't have to bribe our mentors with chickens to learn computers and hacking. Um, but this can be a very painful process. So one of the questions I ask many of our guests that come on our show is how did you get your start in security? One of the more popular answers is, well, I got hacked. And I was curious and I started looking into it and I was like, well, I can do this as a job. So certainly, you know, that's been a path for many people in our field is getting hacked and having that experience definitely breeds interest and can get you into the field. Also, you can do that in a formalized setting in CCDC competitions, which is great. You can be in the firewalls involved with many of them. They're awesome. Um, so yeah, and getting hacked shows you not how not to play defense, right? And you can learn. Now, short of like just putting up honeypot systems or not patching your stuff and coming to a conference and using the Wi-Fi, like that's one way to learn how to get hacked. Probably not the best idea, just saying. Um, you can go read about breaches. Now, uh, I did not get a chance to update. I think Dave talked about the Shadow Brokers release, right, and all the tools. Uh, that's probably a little more updated information. However, this uh, hack team breach, they went into like excruciating details and exactly how they hacked the hacking team's systems. This is great. You can learn how to get hacked just by reading about it. You don't have to have your own systems get hacked. Uh, like Red Hat 5.2 when you put it on the internet in the late 90s, that would always get hacked. Um, I was trying to come up with a, a parallel to this, and I, I kind of just came up short. But basically, uh, in China, and especially, uh, specifically in Taiwan, my teacher would uh, tell me this story. My teacher's from Taiwan. And he would say, you know, there was all these people that wanted to learn Kung Fu. There were more students than there were teachers. So at the local school, the Kung Fu teacher would put up a message board that said, hey, anyone that wants to learn Kung Fu, come into the auditorium after class. So all, like, 100 students would come in, and the teacher would walk out and say, get into horse stance. And that's horse stance. And everyone would get into horse stance. And then he'd go back into his office, he'd read the paper, sip some tea, come out about 25 minutes later, 30 minutes later, about half the people are long gone. They're like, screw that. And so he's like, oh, still too many. Go back into his office, read more of the paper, sip his tea, come out, you know, maybe there's like 20 or so people. He'd do that one more time, come out, there'd be five people left, still standing in horse stance after an hour. Come back tomorrow to learn Kung Fu. 
I don't know that there's a parallel. Like, what would you do? Hey, ping this host or hack into this host until your fingers fall off. I don't know if there's a parallel into uh, computer security for that. Uh, and good thing we're not made to sit in horse dance before we learn how to hack. OK. In the <laughs> Kung Fu Masters have friendly battles where they test each other's skills. This is a variation on the theme. I think it's best represented in the film Ip Man uh, with Donnie Yen, who actually his mom trained uh, here in Boston, uh, actually in his uh, very well decorated uh, Kung Fu master and Kung Fu teacher. And Donnie Yen actually trained here in Boston for some time as well, before he went on to star in movies with Jet Li. Sorry, I'm getting a little off on a tangent here. Reel it back in. <laughs> so he plays uh, Ip Man, who's a very famous Kung Fu teacher. And um, when in the first movie, he is challenged by a master. And it's very clear that Donnie Yen's character, Ip Man, is more skilled in Kung Fu. But they fight, and the other teacher fights, and they're testing each other's skills, right? Because you go off and you learn all of this stuff, whether you're learning Kung Fu or whether you're learning hacking, and you're like, I get to test this stuff out in the real world. I get to see if it actually works. So Kung Fu teachers would challenge each other to duels. They wouldn't hurt each other, right? They would, it would be a friendly fight to see where they were at with their skills so they knew what they had to work on. You can do the same thing in computer hacking, right? And the, the lesson is like boards don't hit back, right? You want a more realistic training environment than just putting up a vulnerable host in your lab. Sure, that's one thing, but you're not actually doing that in the real world. Um, so here's where I want you to challenge yourself. I want you to, number one, don't be afraid of a capture the flag, right? Very different from I set up a, you know, a vulnerable system in my lab and I'm breaking into it to I'm in a live fire hacking environment in a CTF, I have a team, and I have to apply my skills. So definitely do that. And don't, I think people get intimidated. Like, I got to know how to code and assembly and write exploits in order to do a CTF. No, you don't. You can go and learn and test your skills. And it's OK. You'll come out of that with what you have to improve on in your skill set. Right? And I also encourage people to take classes that are above, maybe above your skill level. If you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm skilled enough, like that's the purpose of the class, is to teach you that stuff. Now, if you don't have Linux fundamentals down, don't take a class on exploit development. Okay? Like there's limits here. Take a class on Linux and learn Linux. You could probably get people to teach you Linux for free. We're trying to actually put together a free seminar for my employees who are not security people, they're media production folks. But I've told them they have to learn Linux, because much of our code base runs on Linux that runs our podcast, because I wrote a lot of it. And so they're going to take Linux training. Once you get the foundation, then you can start testing your skill level. But you get the foundation first. The other thing, speaking of free stuff, is hacking challenges. Go to holidayhackchallenge.com, all of the links that are on there. My good friend, uh, Ed Scotus, has given away all of these hacking challenges for free. You can go download them. You can do every single individual, it's like an individual capture the flag event, like he gives you some files and you have to and decode them and uh, decrypt them, uh, figure out puzzles, and do hacking along the way. All of those are completely free. You can leave this presentation and go do these today for absolutely zero dollars. And they're all available there. They're available as challenges and the answers are there in the entire archive of, I think there's seven or eight of them that Ed has done, and he does one every year. The last couple have been holiday hack challenges. Um, which involve a, a, a video game and a website and, and, and all that stuff. But they're all out there for free. OK. So that's the, the teaching stuff. Now we're going to talk about security and kung fu tactics. In the If you are in a restaurant, there is a 100% chance that you will be in a fight. And it was watching a kung fu movie. And then, like, they're walking in the restaurant, I'm like, thank God, there's going to be a fight scene. And, like, before I can get the words out of my mouth, someone's, like, throwing a chopstick at someone else, and, like, a huge fight breaks out. It's awesome. I, I just don't know when everyone eats. And I, I started thinking about, like, why is it in the restaurant? I think it's because in a restaurant setting, there's lots of props. They can throw bowls and benches and tables. And if it's multi-level, someone always falls off the top level into the bottom level through a table. Uh, so it's very conducive. Uh, to fight scenes. Um, so if you're on the internet, you, there is probably a 100% chance that you will be hacked. Um, this means you're always engaged with attackers, and you need to then look inside of your network and say, OK, I understand I have all these defenses in place. I've done some user awareness training. I've done all of these things. 
but you're still probably hacked in some way, shape, form, or fashion. That's when you need to turn to some of the newer techniques that we're talking about with threat hunting, um, where you're looking for machines that are already compromised in your environment, and you're not looking for how it was hacked, you're looking for the data that was being passed once the system was hacked. Uh, and in my other presentation at 2 o'clock, if you all want to show up for that, that'd be great, thanks. Uh, I'll talk a lot more about the uh, math behind how we're detecting, um, uh, th uh, detecting backdoors and callbacks inside of a network, uh, and we have an open source product for that. Uh, which is this one, Rita, right here. So you'll see more and screenshots of Rita in my presentation at 2. However, Bro IDS is typically also used for this type of threat hunting. And there are uh, two awesome resources here. Um, this one comes from Squirrel, I think put this together. It's like every blog post and research article on threat hunting cataloged in one place. Completely free, you can just go start reading and learning about it. There's also one for threat intelligence, which is awesome because they have ties to each other. It's one of the correlation points for when you're doing threat hunting. Is this IP address bad or is this associated with some bad behavior? Um, so those are some open source threat hunting um, websites for you. Okay, in the... If you rush your training, you will get your ass kicked 100% of the time. And there is this great movie, Clan of the White Lotus. Some of you may recognize the, the priest there, Pai Mei, right? Um, actually, if you watch Kill Bill Volume 2, that's Gordon Liu. He actually plays Pai Mei in Kill Bill Volume 2. But in Clan of the White Lotus in 1980, he played the person fighting him, which I thought was pretty awesome. Uh, and Quentin Tarantino actually dressed for the part of Pai Mei, and he was told he looked absolutely ridiculous, so they, they made Gordon Liu do it. I'm full of useless knowledge like that, by the way. Um, so um, a lot, and this is, ties back to a point that I touched on before. In security, you know, I think a lot of us had started before there was really an official security role in the organization, like you were in, the, in some other form of IT, Right, when I started at, at Brown University, um, I worked in the systems administrations group. There was no security uh, team uh, like 15 years ago. Obviously, things have changed since then. However, the benefit that we had back then was a lot of us worked like not in security for a while before we started doing security. So we worked on the help desk. We worked on the network operations team. We worked on the sysadmin team. We got a taste for what it was like to actually build systems and make them work before we started breaking into them. And this is what I mean by rushing your training. Don't just go and start taking Metasploit classes without understanding how stuff works. Set up in your own labs stuff that makes stuff work, right? When I went for my job interview at, at Brown University, they, uh, they asked me like, if I had experience with uh, NFS and uh, in, in Unix. And I was like, yeah, I had that set up at my house. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, I brought a picture of my uh, you know, server rack at home that I used for my lab. And they're like, you have more than some of our data centers in, in your house. I'm like, yeah, that's where I set up NFS. They were like, wow, like I cut the grass at home and stuff. Um, <laughs> they're like, and they hired me. I don't know if that worked for everyone. Um, but figure out how to get stuff working, right? Set up, and I can tell you right now, the research I've been doing lately, if you want to get into penetration testing in any capacity, you have to learn Active Directory. I mean, you have to know Active Directory like really well. It's one reason like I don't do a lot of pen testing anymore because I don't have the patience or the time to go learn Active Directory. I learn enough to be dangerous, but you have to know that stuff inside out and backwards. You should have that set up in your home. You should be learning it, figuring out how it works so that when it comes time to break it, you have a foundation. Um, so, when you do build your lab at home, right, have a plan. What are your goals? What areas do you want to focus on? What are your goals in your career? Build the lab. Sign up for free and low-cost training, okay? Cybrary uh, has free training that's available, itpro.tv. We have a 50% discount code that we're running on our show for itpro.tv. They're both awesome websites. Um, we're partners in some capacity with both. itpro.tv is actually a full sponsor of our, our, net, our entire network. Uh, and a lot of people have done projects with them. Uh, Cybrary is also a partner as well. We're starting to syndicate some of our content on Cybrary. But for you, the benefit is it's like either free or really low cost training that you can gain access to libraries and libraries of training uh, on the internet, which is awesome. 
Um, practice every day and make sure you get a mentor. We cover that. Okay. So in the there is always someone more skilled than you. And in this movie, um, Wing Chun, actually, who's another famous martial artist, who happens to be a woman. And in the movie, Michelle Yeoh is dressed up as a man. I mean, she doesn't look like a, I mean, she's supposed to look like a man, but like you can, you know the actress, so you're like, that's ridiculous. And the movie kind of, is extremely ridiculous, and it's funny. But uh, she's dressed up as a man, and um, I, people don't think that she has the skills, but uh, spoiler alert, she kicks everyone's ass, and it's awesome, right? Um, so, you know, while you may not think someone has skills, they might, um, and someone out there probably has more skills than you. Um, and attackers might be more skilled than you as well. You need to learn from that. Now, a lot of attackers, don't get me wrong, I've seen a lot of attackers be really, really dumb, and that's usually the ones that we see, right? The ones that are really smart, we may not see, but when we do, we have to appreciate that they might be more skilled than us. Um, and others in the security community may be less skilled than you. In the other light, don't poke fun at them. I mean, basically, when I've spoken with people like H.D. Moore um, and uh, the Kismet Mike Kershaw, and uh, Fyodor of Nmap, right? They run these really large open source projects. And people ask dumb questions all the time. And all three of them pretty much had the same advice because I was like, how do you, you deal with that and how do you prevent a toxic environment from being created on your mailing list and chat and all that stuff where people are asking dumb questions and they're like, basically, don't be a dick. was <laughs> what they told me. They're like, be nice to people. And that message really stuck through uh, with me as I went through my career in InfoSec, and it's something that I've tried to coach people on as well, don't dismiss people if they have a really stupid question. Now, I, Dave Kennedy posts some of the feedback that he gets on his website, I think, to Facebook, and clearly there are some really dumb people that are like, hey, can you hack into someone's email account for me? It's like, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about here. Right? I'm talking about people actually asking legitimate questions. Okay, in the... The weapon you choose matters little. It takes skill to win. Uh, that is, unless you're Lao Kar Leung. He was teaching Kung Fu at five years old. It's amazing. Uh, he's one of the most amazing martial artists. Um, he holds the lineage uh, for Hungar, uh, Kung Fu, or he did until he passed away and passed that on to others as well. Um, and this style of Kung Fu uh, comes from Wang Fei Hong, very famous Chinese hero. He has his own theme song, okay? Like, that's awesome. Like, I want my own personal theme song. That'd be awesome. Wang Fei Hong had his own theme song uh, because he was so influential uh, in, in Chinese martial arts history. Uh, and Lao Kar Leung can pretty much pick up any weapon. Uh, there's a movie, Legendary Weapons of China, where in the end he picks up every Kung Fu weapon that I knew to exist and even ones that I didn't, and uses them to like beat someone's ass. It's awesome. Definitely highly recommend the film. Um, so just because you have a sword, though, <laughs> doesn't mean you're dangerous, right? I mean, not all of us started teaching kung fu when we we're five, right? That's an anomaly. We can't just pick up a sword and be effective with it, right? We need training. Um, and so my advice on, on this level is, uh, also from an awesome film, uh, 36 Chamber Shaolin with Gordon Liu, he figures out that he can't beat his teacher to get to the next level. He has to beat his teacher to get to the next level. And he just keeps losing and losing. And then he's like in the woods and he's all mad and he smashes his staff against the tree and it breaks and like makes a section. So then he smashes the other side and he makes like three sections and then, spoiler alert, he kicks his teacher's ass, which is awesome. It's all, he creates the three-section staff. If you've ever tried to wield one, it's awesome. I should probably bring one to the talk for demonstration. It's awesome. You hit yourself in the head and the shin at the same time. It's amazing. Um, so, but it, so he built his own tools, right? Now, there may have been other similar tools out there. That's OK. Me, personally, I decided I want to write a port scanner in C just because, right? I decided I want a Honeyport script in Python. Now, there's lots of Honeyport type scripts out there, but I wanted the experience. So when you go build something yourself, a tool, if there's other things that exist, that's OK. Build it for your own experience. The same thing, we do a show Startup Security Weekly. You want to start your own company, 
don't worry about being the only one in the space. That's like a freakish anomaly. Like Uber is like an anomaly. That's like one in a billion or a hundred million of companies that are going to be the next Uber, right? Don't worry about going into a crowded space. Focus on what you do best and follow your passion. That's going to be a much better path for you than worrying about how unique you are when you write a tool or, or create a company. Um, also, along these lines, um, tools don't necessarily help us get the job done. Um, I mean, unless like you're Chuck Norris, that's different, right? That's the other anomaly. But um, in this quote from this awesome article, uh, Gary Kasparov was once the greatest chess player in the world. He played the IBM computer. Uh, he lost. Teams after that played the computer. Now, they weren't the best chess players in the world, right? They were good chess players, but they weren't the best in the world. They also had a computer and software to help them with that. They also had a really good process. And we read this article and we're like, oh wow, so like when we look for vendor solutions, like you can't just buy software and have it solve your problems. You need smart people, you need a good process, and you need some tools. And you need all three of those things to be successful in a lot of the things we do, offense or defense. Okay, in the... The best defense is always to have a good offense. Uh, one of my, and it's, this is a terrible movie, actually. The one with Jet Li. Has anyone seen the one with Jet Li? Anyone? A couple of people. You wish you could get your time back. Yeah, it was pretty bad. But one of the awesome things in this movie was there's two versions of Jet Li. There's the good Jet Li, the bad Jet Li, and they come from alternate universes. I told you it was a bad movie. And so, but the style of kung fu that they use in the movie fits their character perfectly. The good Jet Li uses Bagua, right? Very soft, circular motions, right? The bad Jet Li uses Jing Yi, very hard, fast movements, both internal styles, by the way. But you know, it said Bagua will go around the wall, Jing Yi will just burst right through the wall. So it was really cool to see those styles in use. Now in Jing Yi, every block is also a strike. It's all about being on offense at all times in this particular style of Kung Fu. Okay? I liken that to a lot of things we're talking about with web applications. And the web application landscape right now is very, very interesting. And I think to be really successful, we have to be on the offense the entire time to defend our web applications. And we started out with this thing called WAF, right? Turns out processing all of those requests and having very little understanding of your web application and trying to block things, not such a good idea. Now, if you use a WAF successfully, we, we should talk. Um, it might be a short conversation. I hope I could persuade you to some newer technologies that are out there. So then we said, let's develop uh, RASP, right? And RASP is a small program that sits inside the web application server, the application server, and monitors all of those requests. So it has knowledge. It can look at a function call and says, hey, that function call normally does this, but now it's doing this other thing. It doesn't have to worry about hundreds of thousands of requests from the front end. It's just looking at the back end with knowledge and intelligence, right? And there's some vendors in that space. Then there's the cloud DMZ vendors. They take your entire application and they put it up in the cloud. They do all of the protections and you just manage it remotely. So that's kind of interesting. You give up some control. However, they're able to put it up in that DMZ. They have technology that can kind of throw away basically everything that's coming at them, and they're just looking at what's going on inside of your application. It's kind of like a hosted RAS, think of it. Now, there's some, some new ones that are like a, I call it like a WAF RASP cloud DMZ. I think they're creating a new market, right? It's a bold move. If you're creating a new company, you're trying to create a new market, right? Because everyone like, we know what a WAF is, right? Some people are starting to learn what RASP is. Like, that's a market as well. Signal Sciences and Immunio, they're creating an entirely new market. What they're doing is they can put an agent on your system. They can hook into your web server, not your application server, but like an Apache module. Or they can hook directly in your application server. They collect data. They put it up in the cloud. They do machine learning. Actual, well, Signal Sciences does actual machine learning because it's actually the folks that came from Etsy and developed their security program for their web applications that founded the company. Uh, full disclosure, they are a sponsor. But I like their technology because it lets you look at all of the performance things and all the security things in, in one screen, and it's doing that differently from all of the other web application technologies. Um, so that's kind of a, a brief overview of the, the web application landscape. Okay, how are we doing on time? Uh, we got about 15 minutes 
OK, good. Thank you. Uh, number 10. The softer styles of kung fu always lead to victory. Has anyone seen the Tai Chi Master with Jet Li? Anyone? Couple, couple people? Awesome movie, right? My favorite part of the movie is when Jet Li literally goes insane. Like he loses his mind in the movie. And those who think Jet Li isn't a good actor, you have to watch that movie. Because he does a really good job. And it's really funny because he goes crazy. And then like magically he comes to his senses and realized because his fr best friend turned on him and is now in cahoots with the government and killed his friends and, and all this stuff happened. And then Jet Li realizes that the only way to beat his friend is to learn Tai Chi and integrate the harder styles of Kung Fu with the softer style of Kung Fu. And he goes on to victory. Um, so I started to think about some of the softer styles, and I'll actually integrate this uh, in a different uh, uh, lens in my, in my other talk as well. Uh, the soft, softer styles, insecurity almost, lead to, almost always lead to victory more so than the harder styles, right? So I did it this little pie chart, right? And um, these are how vulnerabilities are really fixed in an organization. And this red area right here, that's your vulnerability management program like on its own without working together. Um, and this is like the yellow, this is your patch management program, like working in a silo and, and not working together. And this like little green slice right here, that's like Bob the IT guy just going around and like fixing stuff on his own and patching things. And this blue area is actually working together as a team. The most successful vulnerability management programs, do you know which product they use from which vendor? Anyone? I used to work for a vendor, anyone? Anyone? It doesn't matter. They can use whatever they want. The most successful ones develop software themselves to integrate the workflow between vulnerability management and patch management and remediation. Almost always, I mean, they will actually come to me and say, we kind of, I don't know if we want to maintain this anymore. It's really expensive. Like, what can we buy? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> you're doing awesome. Like, you, don't, you can go, go get a drink. Like, you're fine. Um, that has, those have been the most successful programs that I've seen. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of people about their vulnerability management programs. So uh, working together as a team is an integral part. And it's one of those softer styles, right, um, that we have to learn as information security professionals. We're often put in that situation where we have to get someone to do something that might not be in their job description. So we definitely need those softer styles. Incident response is a great example of that, right? We have to get our entire team on board to say, hey, you know what, if we're hacked really bad, hey, you, Bob, you have to stop what you're doing, whatever project you're on, and you've got to do stuff for security. And Bob's like, but security is Paul's problem. No, 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 no. Security is everyone's problem, OK? And we all need to work together. And that's part of the softer styles. Um, that I'm talking about. So we have done some of that, right? I am the Calvary. We had Katie Mazuris and Josh Corman on our show to talk about healthcare security. It, based off of a tweet that I put out there, because I'm like, well, first of all, you just can't go poking fun at all the heinous vulnerabilities, well, you can, but all the heinous vulnerabilities and IoT devices that are used in healthcare, right? So my tweet somehow garnered a lot of attention. My son was born in June last year, and when my wife was in labor, I had my phone out, and she was like, you're not tweeting, are you? I'm like, no, no, I'm not tweeting while you're in labor. We said no social media while you're in labor, right? And then she's like, oh, look at the baby's heartbeat on the screen. And I'm like, is that Windows 98? <laughs> she wasn't too happy with me at that point. And then she's like, you're not tweeting that, are you? I'm like, no, no. And so I tweeted it. And it was the most retweeted, shared, and liked tweet that I ever made. Katie Mazura said it got more retweets than when she launched some very famous programs at Microsoft. So I was like, wow, this is really a problem that we need to address. And so we had them on the show to talk about, well, yeah, we can point at things and go, that's Windows 98 and that's bad. But what do we really do to fix the problem? It turns out like talking to people and trying to affect change is a lot harder than just pointing at something and saying it's Windows 98. Um, she did, my wife did lift the social media ban. I'm like, we're trending on Twitter. This is awesome. She's like, really? While I'm in labor? She's like, wait, how many retweets did you get? <laughs> <clears throat> um, you also don't need expensive tools to win. Um, one of the things when you first start a martial arts training is you learn to use the staff. Because once you learn to use the staff, conceivably, you can pick up any other weapon 
and be effective with it because the fundamental principles are the same. Just like you can pick up a chair or a bench, right, like they had in China, and uh, be very effective with it, and that's really cool. Um, it turns out that you really don't need expensive tools to win at computer security either. And there are some examples here, and it's actually, this was actually the foundation for the talk I'm giving at 2 o'clock. My original thought was I'm going to talk about enterprise security tools that are free, right? And I don't know, for whatever reason I decided to go in different directions, but that's kind of how it all started. And as I talk to a lot of organizations, uh, whether it's a casual conversation at uh, conference or in the bar afterwards, or if it's a more formal thing in some consulting I do for EINs, I noticed a theme emerging that a lot of enterprises are using open source software. A lot of enterprises are using Bro. A lot of enterprises are um, using Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics, which is not, it's either included or, or free, right? PFSense firewalls. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there that's completely free. So you don't need expensive tools to win. Um, okay, so this is some political and social things. Number 11. The bad guys are always in cahoots with the government. Uh, take from that what you will. Draw your own conclusions about politics today. Um, but almost always, uh, as an iron monkey, right, the, the enemy in this case uh, is the government. And the hero in this movie uh, is a Robin Hood-like character that steals from the rich and gives to the poor is basically the plot uh, of Iron Monkey, but the bad guys are definitely government, and uh, the people like even the Shaolin monks in this movie are in cahoots with the government. Um, so this is where we talk about state-sponsored hacking and being in cahoots with the government. You know, this is obviously, Dave touched on this in his keynote, this is obviously an entire talk in and of itself. Um, However, if you're not gonna, if you're tired of watching kung fu movies, because you're gonna go watch a lot of kung fu movies after this talk, you should also watch the documentary film Zero Days. Little, little corniness in there. I don't want to spoil it for you. I won't spoil this one for you. Um, but really delves into this topic and kind of gets you thinking about how the bad guys are in cahoots with a lot of governments, not just one. Okay, number 12. The protagonist always wants to learn kung fu to take revenge. I would say 80 to 90 percent of the kung fu movies out there uh, are revenge-based plots, right? The best revenge-based plot is Eight Diagram Pole Fire, again, with Gordon Liu, Lao Kar Leung, also uh, in that movie as well. Um, this movie was awesome, just as a side note. Uh, there was a, a famous actor uh, in Chinese Kung Fu cinema that actually died in a car cra motorcycle or car crash during the filming of this movie. And that feeling of the uh, uh, actors and actresses in this film really comes through. Like, you can just see the expression on his face in this final fight scene. Like, they're just visibly upset. And it really adds um, a dimension to the film that is just awesome. I mean, it's like some of the greatest scenes in Kung Fu movies. Like, he walks up with this gigantic car of staffs and then, like, drops it and then, like, pushes the whole bunch of the staffs and they're, like, stabbing people. It's just spectacular. It's awesome. It's a really cool movie, but very much revenge-themed. Uh, revenge hacking is not really a, a good idea, though, <laughs> in computer security. Not where you want to go. Um, hacking into other people's systems, even if you're the good guy, trying to get back at the bad guy. The FBI has gotten into a lot of trouble lately. There have been a lot of public scrutiny for some of the things that they did, especially with Operation Playpen. And new information is coming out about that all the time. Word is, the latest on, on this story is they've got an exploit for Tor. They can uncover users. They won't bring it up in court, because then it would be public. So, OK, number 13. The most popular kung fu movies aren't always the best ones. And this one really pains me because everyone talks about Five Fingers of Death, right? It was the movie in the 1970s that started the kung fu craze. It was in screens all across the US. And people are like, this is the greatest kung fu movie ever. It's, eh. I mean, it's when his palm glows red, like that's really cool. I think that's awesome. Um, the original title of that film is actually King Boxer, uh, for those who want more useless kung fu movie uh, trivia. But um, so the most popular vendors aren't necessarily the best. And we have a lot of choices out there today. 
We have an entire show where we're looking at uh, new vendors, new products, new product features and integrations called Enterprise Security Weekly. And I have to say, a lot of the larger players either bite off more than they can chew or they don't keep up with their technology. Um, Trend Micro just had a, an announcement. They're like, we use machine learning. Like said nothing else on how they're using machine learning in their antivirus product. I'm like, really? Like, are you just saying that because like all the other cool kids are saying machine learning? Like, oh, we can say machine learning too. Yeah, we got that. We're cool too. Like, no, just because you're the popular doesn't mean that you're the best. Uh, there are some, like Silence, to bit off a little more they can chew, wanted to be the next big antivirus player. Uh, not so much working out for them, uh, although they put a lot of money in marketing, so they would seem like a big player. That doesn't necessarily there mean they're their best. Now, silence may work for some people, and that's fine. Uh, I'm not disputing that. So, um, and big players in SIM, too. I mean, they're losing to some of the smaller players. Um, EUBA companies are coming in and saying, hey, spend like 20 grand less with your SIM and give that to us, and we'll give you more functionality. Or maybe you even save 20 grand after you've paid 20 grand for the product. So there's a lot of interesting things happening uh, in the vendor space. OK. Uh, moving quickly because I probably only have about five minutes left. In the Kung Fu movies, <laughs> students use Kung Fu to overcome personal challenges. The Crippled Avengers is one of the most hilarious movies. There's like one dude that's blind, another one that has no legs, another one that just goes crazy, which is really funny to watch. And I forget the other, but they use Kung Fu to overcome personal challenges. Um, and What's interesting is many use hacking tools, many I've met in, in my career here in information security, use hacking and hacking tools in the community to overcome personal challenges. Um, you know, we have our own awkward hugging website. Like, how awesome is our community? Like, Jason's here. Is Jason, he's not, he didn't come to my talk, jerk. Never mind, forget what I, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so we have our own awkward hugging website. Like, how awesome is that? Uh, the security community is really great. Um, and there's always a new challenge that constantly evolves, right? It's always keeping your attention and helping you maybe overcome those personal challenges by just having a really engaging and fun job in computer security. Um, and I think it builds your confidence too, right? We're all trying to do the right thing and protect people. Hopefully we all are. Better not kick your ass. All right. Number 15. <laughs> the righteous path is fraught with peril, but always leads to a hero. So, the protagonist in the film often has to endure several challenges. Gordon Liu has to jump over this moat in this movie in order to eat rice. And if his clothes get wet, he can't eat the rice. It's a really interesting thing uh, that he goes through. So there's a lot of peril. And then they come out of that uh, like better people, essentially. So security is hard. There's my token unicorn. Um, and what, you know, what people say is, that, well, I can just do X to prevent breaches, or uh, my network was easy to secure, I just did this. Like, you don't hear people saying that. I hope you don't. Uh, security is hard, and there's a lot of challenges that we have to overcome in order to achieve a secure network. Um, so in that respect, it is uh, a parallel to uh, some of the Kung Fu movies. Okay, number 16. <laughs> so sometimes the heroes don't start out as such. Uh, this is Jet Li uh, in a film, and in this film with Jet Li, he is kind of a, um, well, he's an asshole in the film, and he beats people up, and he hurts them really bad, and he kills someone, and then Jet Li's family gets killed, and then he goes out into the woods, and he learns Tai Chi, and he comes back, and he kicks everyone's ass, and he's a hero, okay? Hopefully there's not too many spoilers in there. You still watch the movie. It's awesome. Um, so, but he start, did not start out as a hero, right, at all. Um, there are a lot of people in our industry that did not necessarily start out as heroes, um, but have turned over a new leaf and are doing good things. And hopefully you recognize uh, everyone in here, Kevin Mitnick, Sammy Kamkar, and Kevin Polson. Okay. Okay. I think we're going to end on time. How much time do I have left? Like two minutes? Okay, I'm done. Useless Kung Fu movie facts uh, and other stuff. Um, this is my top ten list of Kung Fu movies right here. Okay. Um, so take a, a picture of that. I'll try and post the slides for you. I'll let everyone take a picture of that. Your homework is to go watch all those movies. They're awesome. They're great. Um, on my, they're on my website now. I should have put the link on the last side. Maybe at 2 o'clock I'll put the link for this talk because I have to look it up. Okay, so here's five more for good measure. Like these are really good too. And 
like, I, I just, I couldn't, like, these are five more, <laughs> which were like, they're really awesome too. Um, and I'm not the best screen, on screen martial artist. That's actually me, and that, that is a shovel reenacting a scene from a kung fu movie. But these are what I thought were the best on screen martial artists. Definitely not good thing I have a job in security, is all I have to say. Um, ridiculous facts. Uh, people say you must be tired of living like a lot, which I think is a really great line in other stuff. And I think that's it.